name. Patricia, James, Spalding. Gordon, Benson, Carla. Susan, Rita, Poolin. Age. 62. 51. Uh, 58, I think. Marital status. Married to Gordon for 19 years. I'm with her. <laughs> Married 19 years, now divorced. Eyes. Blue. A hazel with a brown stripe in this one. Hair. Brown. And gray. What hair? <laughs> you just have a bold forehead. Huh? A bold forehead. It's sexy. I think gray hair is sexy too. So do I. Count your blessings, Gordon. <laughs> Count your blessings. And you, Gordon, are very blessed. Hey, I used to have hair. I believe it. Really? Down to here. And you know what? It was a total pain in the neck. A complete disaster. Thank you. See, for one thing, you weren't allowed to have long, hippie hair in high school. So I had to wait a full six years to grow mine out. And it was coming in great, too. Nice and full. Until my family genes kicked in. Then you could practically hear those little buggers laughing. Ha <laughs> ha! He thinks he's growing long hair. Surprise! <laughs> Up on this hill where once a wilderness arose, nothing ever grows. <laughs> what was once a little woodland clearing has come to look like Highway 302. There was nothing he could do. By the time I turned 24, I saw a chrome dome coming. Not a pompadour. Day by day, the trees began to dwindle, till all that was left were some sorry looking spindles. Started brushing it back, as if you suffer a loss. Nothing looks worse than if you comb it across. They tell me a hat will only flatten your hair. I don't worry about that.
returning from a cross-country road trip, headed east on I-80, knocking off the miles in the driver's seat. Everything was in its place. Coffee mug on the council, AAA triptych next to that, and a map of the United States of America unfolded in my lap. I was feeling pretty good. Till I found myself squinting. <laughs> trying to decipher those tiny little root numbers on the trip. <laughs> I reached for my glasses case. No glasses. Felt around inside my pocketbook. <laughs> top of the seat. Between the seats. Under the seat. Top of the dashboard. Inside every crevice, cubby, and catch-all within the radius of my right hand reach when I discovered I was looking through my glasses. <laughs> them. <coughs> this typical incident made me feel a little bit foolish and just a tad old. Now, I've heard it said that one can stretch out the various stages of one's youth until about age 30, 5, for the next 10, 15, 20 years. If you can't admit to being middle-aged, which I always had a problem with, you have to at least admit to being in the latter years of your youth. <laughs> By age 60, <laughs> you really can't stretch it any further. You've lost the necessary college and elasticity. <laughs> You've hit the meatball. The only claim to youth that you can now realistically make is that you are in the youth of your old age. <laughs> so there I was, on the outskirts of Cleveland, looking at the map, when it occurred to me that if California were to represent the youth of my youth, and the state of Maine, my old age, well, right now, I am driving through Ohio. Ohio, how undistinguished. <laughs> it was never my plan to get here. I don't remember reading the road signs that said, this way to Ohio. I mean, sure, I passed soft shoulders, sharp curves, danger, men at work, passed them quite a while back, as I recall. And now more signs are telling me to reduce speed, <laughs> slow traffic ahead. <laughs> I never used to notice these signs. Now, they're everywhere. The early years of my life were a leisurely stroll down the metaphoric highway. I spent a long time in California just learning how to walk. I toddled through Nevada, skipped across Utah, then slowed down to stroll through Colorado. Looking around, looking good, getting looks back. In Nebraska, the pace picked up. I started to jog. Slow down, you're moving too fast. Got to make Iowa last. Why? <laughs> I hit Illinois running. Indiana sped by, and now Ohio smellers stays ahead. They go by faster and faster and faster and faster and stop. It's okay to be in Ohio, the youth of my old age. I don't mind that the shorter the rest of the tour, the more need I feel to hurry. I don't mind that I am now invisible to male strangers. No longer a yield sign but just another median strip along I-80 that goes unnoticed by the traffic flow. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I don't mind that I know well agree. Looks, second looks, glances. Well, maybe. From the guys wearing the wide white belts and the matching shoes, <laughs> who look to me to be considerably older than I am, who are, in fact, my age. Well, these guys are in the Ohio, their lives too. So they're looking for looks for me. Okay, if they look first, I'll look back. I don't mind. Being referred to by waiters, waitresses, counter help, receptionists as the generic ma'am. <laughs> Doesn't it bother you? May I help you, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, help me. Help me get back to Colorado. <laughs> nah. The road trip continues. But I know that this middle place in my life, like the middle American state of Ohio, has something to teach me about freedom. There is a freedom in letting go 
It's time to let go of the angst-filled challenges of youth, to let go of my youthful self-image, to let go of the accumulation of more stuff, and free myself up to appreciate everything I've got. Every single ordinary mediocre day. Mm -hmm. Things that I used to take for granted. Things like convenience stores, convenience foods, convenience in general. Hey, I now find very convenient. <laughs> I appreciate the convenience of all-you-can-eat salad bars and breakfast buffets off exit ramps. I appreciate the convenience of rest areas a lot. <laughs> I look forward to crossing state lines where welcome stations are conveniently located. I stop at every single one to pick up a free map, and then I study it thoroughly. This is another clue that I've reached a certain age. How many of you out there know what Ohio's official state bird is? <laughs> yes, Michael? Cardinal? The cardinal. You're right. How about its state flower? The red carnation. State insect? <laughs> Don't know if you know. The ladybug. Yes, the ladybug. And it has a state beverage, which is... Not beer. Tomato juice. <laughs> These facts are true. In my youth, I never would have gleaned as much information from a road map. Now I find it compelling. What do all of these various birds, bugs, beverages, and flowers have in common? Red. The color red. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> Obviously, the key legislators of Ohio has been enough time in their state to understand the importance of bright coloration. So, take a tip from them. Whether you're in the middle of Ohio, the middle of your life, with red, you'll show up better. <laughs> And yes, rock song, I found it on the map. <laughs> now, some of you already know this, I think. <laughs> Any guesses from somebody who really doesn't know? <laughs> Hang on, Sloopy. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I think I know. To what fine quality can a middle American state like Ohio honestly lay claim which will distinguish it from the other 49? It is the same fine quality that distinguishes youth from middle age. Perseverance. <laughs> Ohioans persevere, like me, like you, like Sloopy. They hang on. <laughs> so if you too, maybe in the Ohio of your life, would neither fame nor fortune in your rear view mirror, nor the expectation of it along the road ahead. Hang on to the steering wheel. Slow down. Stop at the welcome station. Pick up a free map and study it for clues about the state that you've just entered. Baby boomers, let us grab our coffee mugs, decaf, of course, our reading glasses, our triple-A trip kicks, and proceed with caution along the road ahead. Remember Ohio's official rock song and take heart. Hang on, Sloopy. Sloopy, hang on. <laughs>
See, I've been looking for Barry Nice for about two months. I started when there was still enough Barry Nice left in the tube so I could put it on without looking in a mirror. All the women in my family have this special skill. It's genetic. <laughs> I was walking through the ma main mall and I thought, hey, there's a body shop. I'll get a tube of Barry Nice while I'm here. They were out. No big deal. But I started to get a little nervous when the only way to get the lipstick out of the tube and onto my lips was with a lip brush, which I have to use a mirror for. Genetics can only take you so far. <laughs> I found excuses to go to malls in my general area, all right, within a 60-mile radius, and drop in on the body shop to see if they had very nice. No one did. Nobody. I started to panic. Finally, the sad day came when even my lip brush could no longer coax any color out of the empty tube. <laughs> Still, I couldn't bring myself to throw it away. I kept it in my purse, hoping for a miracle. Yes, that it would spontaneously regenerate, or at the very least act as a talisman to draw another tube of very nice. <laughs> I know this sounds kind of sad and pretty superficial, but you got to understand. Very nice is the perfect shade of lipstick for me. It's my Goldilocks of lipsticks. Not too pink, not too orange, not too red. It's just, well, very nice. And believe me when I say that finding the perfect shade of lipstick is not as easy as it sounds. Am I right? Right. I have a whole drawer filled with lipsticks that look good in the store when I surreptitiously break the seal and I try it in my hand. But when I get it home, it morphs into some hideous color. I quickly move through the five stages of grief. Denial. This color's great. It's just the bathroom light that's making it look incredibly unflattering. Anger. I can't believe I spent another $9 on a tube of lipstick I can't wear. Bargaining. Well, if I put candied pink under it and maple sugar gloss over it, depression. Maybe I should just throw myself on my mascara wand and end it all. <laughs> Acceptance. It'll look good on my sister. <laughs> so, I'm in Cambridge, Harvard Square, and there's a body shop. And I'm thinking, hey, it's the big city. They have to have Very Nice. But when I look in the rack, the space where Very Nice should be is empty. I walk up to the sales associate, a trendy 20-something, Ashley, it says on her name tag. Ashley, hi. Do you have any very nice uh, lipstick? There's none in the display. Let me check our computer. <laughs> Ashley's cute as a button. Love the pink highlights, I'm thinking. But trim the bangs, lose the nose ring. <laughs> very nice? But I already know what she's going to say. It's been discontinued? This happens more and more lately. I find a pair of jeans I like, a, a moisturizer I love, the perfect shade of lipstick, and then it's discontinued. I know change is supposed to be a good thing, but sometimes I'd like a little less of it. We're getting ready to send some discontinued items back to the warehouse. I'll go check the storeroom. What color is that again? Very nice. Very nice. I'll take as many as you have. <laughs> Ashley's miniskirt-clad body darts between displays and customers. God, how does she stand all day in those platform shoes? I uh, reach into my purse and I surreptitiously pat my empty tube of very luck, very rich for uh, luck. And then I I seek out some lavender hand lotion for its relaxing properties. Ooh, ooh. Rejuvenating mud mask with seaweed and almond oil. No, no, no. I just bought that home microderm abrasion kit. <laughs> Ma'am? Very nice, right? Yes, very nice, very nice. We have ten. I'll take them all. <laughs> so, I'm happily writing a check for $94.50. I hand the check to Ashley, my palms tingling with anticipation of clutching my bulging bag of very nice. Thank you for shopping at the body shop. Have a nice day. Thanks so much for your help, Ashley. I really, really appreciate it. God, I sound pathetic. <laughs> Ashley smiles. She's wearing one of those nearly nude lip glosses. 
I need more color than that, or I just look washed out. Still, Ashley reminds me of when I was 18 and working for Estee Lauder Cosmetics at Jordan Marsh. And I remember middle-aged women, women about the age I am now, coming up to the counter and asking for something, say Miracle Cover Creamy Foundation in Newport Beige. <laughs> and when I told them it was discontinued, ooh, it was sad to watch. <laughs> the 18-year-old me thought, Stop living in the past, Granny. You need to keep up with the times. It's the 70s, for God's sakes. Oh, no. <gasps> Have I become one of those middle-aged women I pitied when I was 18? <laughs> no, that's just silly. I'm not like those middle-aged women. You know, I'm, I'm young. I'm hip. I'm zippy. Uh, Fifty is the new thirty, right? Uh, Mrs. Poulin? Yes? Are these your weaving glasses? <laughs> High school prom theme? Ah, dancing in the moonlight. Apple blossom time. What prom? You didn't go to your prom? No way. Well, what about your high school reunions? Nah. I went to my 10th and my 20th. Me too. The thing that I remember most is that the cliques were still there. Uh, the kids who smoked in front of the high school were smoking in front of the banquet hall. Uh, the nerds were still huddled in the corner and the party girls were still getting drunk and monopolizing the dance floor. Well, what I remember the most is everybody laughing uproariously about things we'd done together in high school, as if it was somehow the high point of their lives. I couldn't remember any of it. Because everything that's happened in the years since then has been way more interesting. Oh, that's oh for I sure. hear you, Pat. Hey, <laughs> our class president emailed me to come to our 40th, and I just said, Ed, thanks. Nothing against you, but why would I go to the reunion? Those are the worst years of my life. Oh, however, God however, did. now that I've got a website, my past is starting to catch up with me. Uh -huh. I'm getting emails from old girlfriends. I just heard from my high school boyfriend, Craig. What a sweet God, talk about the path not taken. He has two kids and a grandchild on the way. Yeah, reconnecting on the web. I reconnected with an old friend. Bad boy from the 80s. Uh-huh. Spill it, Pat. <laughs> well, just the usual, you know, we chatted back and forth by email. Uh-huh. Talked about our exes, his kids. And then one night, I hear a Harley pull up in my driveway. <laughs> it was him. I went to the door and smiled. He took off his helmet. It's been a long time. <laughs> nice, Pat. <laughs> Me, I just found the whole thing kind of confusing. I mean, 30, 40 years on, what were they expecting to find anyway? <laughs> Some older, wiser version of me? Mm, pretty yeah. much, yeah. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> she found herself at 52 with no one to do But look up fellas from her past uh -oh. My info came up fast and we agreed to meet We could not simply hit delete In high school we were hot. The other part of me was not. Was not. A rendezvous arrived, but to my bewilderment, this, this is how things went. I ticked her off. He ticked her off. I'll just cut right to the chase. I ticked her off. He ticked her off. You could see it on her face. And though I'd love to blame it on her irritating call, I know in my heart. Ba -ba -ba -da. Disappointment grew. And grew. I tried to keep it cheerful, but she had none of that. I saw my efforts falling flat. I ticked her off. He ticked her off. Uh, whatever I said, I guess I ticked her off. He ticked her off. That's what you get for cheerfulness. And everything I told her, all she did was scoff and look at me as if I'm not the Apology or maturity, no. or some 
spark from long ago. I just don't know. Soon the question petered out, and she got it to leave. More than just a wee bit pee. I walked her to the car and offered her a hug. She looked like she'd have rather given me a slug. I ticked her off. He ticked her off. I don't know exactly how I ticked her off. He ticked her off. And that's what I'll remember now. <laughs> Not our high school loving, nor the way I got her caught. Just a simple fact. I ticked It is time. 
time for you to take him to bed. Take him to bed? Common sense, I am ashamed of you. Well, that's a switch. <laughs> what is the problem, Body? He is a good man. He is a safe man. He is an available man. <laughs> it's the detailed sense. How can you stand it when I'm trying to eat my nachos, you're trying to have a conversation with him, and he's sitting across the table from us, resting his chin on his hands like this, pretending that he is listening. But you know that he's just waiting for his turn to talk, and you know when that's going to happen, because he always precedes speech by adjusting his glasses on the bridge of his nose. And if you see him make this motion, and you do not allow him to speak, then his leg starts jumping up and down. <laughs> <laughs> How can you stand those things? Sense. I can overlook them. Can you overlook the Guatemalan peasant shirt? <laughs> yes, I can. Can you overlook the penny loafers? Yes, I can. Can you overlook the fact that he wears obsolete New Hampshire highway tokens wedged inside him? <laughs> yes, I can. Oh boy, the fiery ferocity of conflict. Life would be so bland with suppressant emos. Body, you know the drastic consequences of your continued emotional suppression. Yeah, what about sweet? Common sense. You dare mention my right to physical expression when you know, yeah, we're, we haven't, <laughs> you know that it has been four and one half months since, four and one half months of Ziploc nothing, no bananas, not one iota of Yazoo. <laughs> <laughs> That is why I am trying to cooperate with you tonight, body, so that you can get some yazoo. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see it's of no use. Whatever I come up with, you reject. So, you tell me exactly what do you want. Well, let's look around, and I'll show you. <laughs> I want that one. What? We don't even know him. I know. I want to know him. Come on, sis. Make your move. Move? What? I don't move. You're move. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> I will lure him over here. Then you talk to him. Find out a few things. Find out if he's married are involved with a significant other. Why? He's walking this way. I can see that. Sense. But what will I say? Try saying yes for a change. No. All right. We'll make it simple. Just O. Oh, means nothing. Just a letter. O. Oh, try it. Oh, good. Now make it positive. Not a K. Yes, that's the dance. So answer. <laughs> That's not enough information. Okay? Good. I'll take over from here. <laughs> Body, you're hanging all over the man. Do you have to be so obvious? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're embarrassing me. Can't you be more subtle? No. <laughs> I can't. Common sense. I have endured your subtle approaches for four and one half months, which not coincidentally have been the same. One hundred and thirty-nine days that I have endured <laughs> total abstinence. Tonight, I want results. And I'm willing to sacrifice some faculty in order to get results. <laughs> Buddy, he asked us for a nightcap. Just say yes. But first I'd like to understand the implications of that. Just say yes. Oh, okay. Good going. 
on emotions, meet Mr. Opportunity. We got him. We got him. We got him. <laughs> Whoa. We got him? Well. We got him. 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 We got the bad boy tonight. Oh, my. <laughs> Frankly, emotions. I would think that you'd be sensing some anxiety here. <laughs> oh, yes, there is some nervous tension. No emotions. We're happy. Remember pleasure. Titillation. Oh, on the other hand, it's kind of fun. Danger. Consequences. Oh, but it's a little scary. But oh, it's good. Oh, oh there's too much new information to process. We can't handle it. Our circuits are overloaded. We want to go home. We want to hide. We want to go to bed. So do I, <laughs> Amos. And you are screwing it all up again. But Bonnie, we're scared. We don't know him. What if he's not nice? Listen to your emotions, body. This opportunity is not in our best interests. <laughs> We're saying good night to the man. Body. There will be other opportunities. Listen, I care about you. Don't you care about me? Yes. You're the only sense I have. <laughs> Good. Let's go home and make popcorn. Oh boy, popcorn and a movie. But it's Friday night. It's Friday night. It's Friday. Which means tomorrow is Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Janice Joplin, 
Hendrix, the Grateful Dead, Country Joe and the Fish. <laughs> hundreds, of us, hundreds of us at the Fillmore singing, and it's one, two, three, one week fighting for. Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. A year later, marching in the streets of Pittsburgh, cops in riot gear flanking us either side, holding our peace signs high, going to jail, getting out, marching again, until finally, by decades end, with far too many friends and heroes fallen realizing that the rest of us are going to have to just pull ourselves together and make some kind of a living. Spend my life
But I find the show very inspiring. They learn how to eat right and how to cook differently, about the importance of exercise. They work out with trainers Bob and Jillian. And <laughs> It's amazing to see the transformation as they drop massive amounts of weight. Some losing 40 to 50 percent of their body weight, which I guess is possible if you start out weighing 300, 400 pounds. Well, the exercise DVDs that I got for Christmas were from The Biggest Loser. Cardio Max is led by trainer Bob and Power Sculpt features Jillian. And this is the best part. Instead of annoyingly buff exercise addicts in skimpy spandex demonstrating the exercises in the background, there are actual contestants from The Biggest Loser, folks who I've gotten to know over the course of the show. They're normal people. They don't always do the exercises perfectly. When they start to feel the burn from too many repetitions of the same thing, they beg the trainer to stop, just like I'm doing at home. But they keep trying. And that makes me feel like if they can do it, so can I. Now, to be honest, I didn't start my new exercise regime on Monday, on January 1st, which was a Thursday, because we were invited to a party on Saturday, January 3rd. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> on Sunday following the party, I cleaned out our cabinets, refrigerator, and freezer of anything that could be a possible deterrent to my new lifestyle. Actually, I ate all the good stuff out of our cabinets, refrigerator, and freezer. That's the last hurrah. I was kind of nauseous by the time I crawled into bed. On the Monday morning, January 5th, I cracked open my DVDs. I approached my new exercise regime with the same sense of moderation I bring to most things, which means that I did the 30-minute routine every day, alternating one day power sculpt and the next cardio max. There are three levels on the exercise DVDs. In my younger days, I would have started with level three, which is the most difficult. But I'm older and wiser now, so I actually began with level one. I did lunges, jumping jacks, alternating lunges, bicep curls, crossover lunges, headbangers, don't ask, lunges with a hop switch. By that night, I was so sore. I had to literally pull myself up the stairs to our bedroom. The next morning, oh, I looked like the hundred-year-old man. Oh, my <laughs> God. But I stuck with it. No pain, no gain, right? By the last week in January, I progressed to level two and increased my commitment to 40 minutes a day. I was determined to transform my body, and I did. I remember the exact moment when I realized I'd attained my goal. Second week in February, I had this blinding moment of clarity when I realized, whoa, my good knee is now my bad knee. <laughs> Which makes my bad knee my good knee. <gasps> I have two bad knees. I went from level one to level two directly into physical therapy. <laughs> my sister Jane did the same thing, only it was her hip that landed her in physical therapy. In March, we took our dad out for brunch to celebrate his per birthday. Picture Jane and I, 49 and 51, hobbling across the parking lot, <laughs> trying to catch up with our 76-year-old dad, who is chuckling, because the irony's not lost on him. And I know that he sees himself in us. This is a man who, in his middle years, ended every ski season with a knee injury. This is the same knee he would later re-injure playing street basketball. Dad has done his time in the land of ace bandages and Bengay, but he's moved on. He's adapted. That's not to say that he doesn't stay fit. You should see how trim he is. But now he exercises in moderation. He walks on the treadmill. He bowls. He golfs. But Jane and I are in the thick of it. In our case, it's the land of ibuprofen, arnica, and tiger bomb. <laughs> but that's where we live. Our bodies are changing faster than we're willing to accept. That's why more middle-aged people suffer strains, sprains, and pulls, the doctor says as he hands me the physical <laughs> therapy referral form. Uh, good to know. Now, can you please tell me, when I hurt myself, am I supposed to put cold or heat on it? Whichever feels better. Neither one feel good, I'm thinking, <laughs> as I limp from his office. With each step, an unseen fist punches me in the hamstring, and then I get it. Those big 
big people on the, ex the Biggest Loser exercise DVDs, those contestants doing lunges, crossover lunges, alternating lunges, lunges with a hop switch, they're in their 20s. That's why they're not falling apart. They have, as my father-in-law would say, young youth on their side. Damn. So I Google exercise DVDs for middle-aged people. There's a lot of exercise for the elderly type things. But then I see it. Billy Blank's Typo Gold, a 35-minute exercise routine for people over 40. Should be here any day now. Hi, hi, oh, God. Pat, Gordon, hey, do you guys have any ibuprofen? Uh, yeah, I think we've got some extra trained Tylenol. I'm getting Tylenol with extra codeine left over from when I passed the kidney stone. Oh, those are so painful. Prescription medication. Asthmanex for asthma. Extendrol. Oh no, it's for allergies. <laughs> <laughs> Bioidentical hormone replacement. It would be too scary to stand up here with a fuzzy memory. Ambient. Fosamax. Without sleep and bone support, I couldn't stand up at all. <laughs> Jeez, remember when drugs were fun? Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. Uh -huh. Remember in school how there was always that kid? You know, the one who always had the line on the latest illicit ah. substances. Oh, Danny LaFly. Chuck. Proctor, up Chuck to his friend. <laughs> in our school, it was Billy Chesbro, the shadowy guy in the hall muttering something to you under his breath. The guy with connections in the city. Ooh. Hey, Susan, Pat, meet me in the woods behind the science building, 3.30. Got some killer stuff. <laughs> Years later, I'd run into friends from those days, and we get to wondering, whatever happened to Billy Chesbro? Did he even graduate? Somebody heard this, somebody heard that, nobody really knew. Billy, this one goes out to you. Subtitled, Better Living Through Chemistry. <laughs> <laughs>
got no men like crisis, long as I got my hula hoop. I got no men like crisis, long as I got my hula hoop. Hula, hula, long as I got my Instead of hitting the bars for happy hour, eh, maybe you stop at an antique store, pick up a little something for the missus. <laughs>
x-ray vision when it came to shopping. She could walk into a store, scan the interior, and know intuitively if there was something in there she'd be interested in. My sister Jane has inherited my mom's special skill, but not me. It seems like if I have money to spend, I can't find anything I like. But if I'm broke, I see all this adorable stuff. <laughs> used to be the other way around when we were kids. In August, I was the one who looked forward to new school clothes shopping, while Jane glumly followed Mom and I around the store whining. We looked through the racks of clothes, bringing her different sizes and styles while she moped in the dressing room. Still, my mother's patience couldn't be shaken. I remember shopping with my mom for an eighth grade prom dress. I must have tried on just about every dress in my size in every store in the mall and ended up going back and getting the first one we looked at. <laughs> my mom never pushed me to make a decision, though. She says, it's a big night, Susan. Make sure you really love it. And I did. I felt so pretty in my brightly floral full-length dress with a elasticized bodice and cap sleeves. But Something happened in my 20s and 30s. I was no longer interested in shopping. I had more important things to do. Oh, I might rummage around at Goodwill or a vintage clothing shop, but the mall, too commercial, too mainstream. My love of shopping didn't disappear entirely, though. It moved to my sister. <laughs> By then, Jane lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and when she visited, she'd come with a list, and she and my mom would shop. They'd spend hours at the outlet malls or checking out the newest store. They would actually go shopping the day after Thanksgiving, the busiest shopping day of the year for fun. Once I turned 40, though, I realized that I could no longer get away with wearing a black t-shirt, crinoline tights, and Doc Martens. I noticed there were items in my closet that were considered vintage, items that I bought new. A friend recently described my style as classic. When did that happen? I always thought I had more of an artsy look. But nowadays, if I try the peasant skirts, the lace, the frills, I don't look artsy. I look like Stevie Nicks, and that's just sad. <laughs> <laughs> the mall called to me again. It was about this time that my mom got cancer and beat it and got it again, almost every year for five years. That last year, Jane moved home from Rhode Island to be a caregiver to my mom. And I visited two or three times a week, and we shopped. Even that last summer, Mom and I at the Christmas tree shop, looking for that special air freshener for the basement. Even in October, two weeks before she died, Mom and Jane at Target buy my mom a new winter coat, the maroon one that hangs in my closet now. Since my mother died, some of the best times I've had with my sister have been shopping together. I can't remember the things we bought, but I remember laughing until we almost peed our pants because a dress made her look like Barbara Bush. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, trying on hip huggers and a skimpy lace top, and Jane said, that makes you look like every slut we knew in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we shop, Jane and I are having so much fun that other women are drawn to us. They ask our advice, we channel our mother, and we help them shop too. <laughs> When we shop together, we bring each other different sizes and styles. We tell the truth if something is unflattering. We encourage each other to spend that extra money for a special piece. We'll walk into a store, and I'll say, don't let me buy anything red or black, because that's mostly what I tend to buy. And Jay will say, don't let me buy anything blue or green. And so our closets have expanded to accommodate a wider range of colors than our mother's clothes. My closet is arranged the way my mom taught me, with similar items together sorted by color. All the, the pants, uh, dresses, skirts, tops, uh, white, yellow, beige, brown, orange, red, mm -hmm. pink, purple, green, blue, black. That, that way it's easier to combine things. You can come up with a lot more outfits. My mom was smart, practical, and stylish, just like her wardrobe. <coughs> Took Jane and I... Uh, days to sort through our mother's clothes. She had things from size 14 to 4. I'm probably 50 golf shirts with matching socks, uh, uh, socks, shorts, hats, and golf gloves. We tried everything on, took the things we knew we'd wear, and brought the rest to Goodwill so more women could have fun shopping too. It's been, oh God, almost six years 
since my mom died. And I still have some items in my wardrobe that were hers. Occasionally, I'll pull a scarf, one of her scarves, out of a drawer, and I know it's my imagination, but I swear, I can smell my mother. A hint of honeysuckle, lilac, l'air du temps. I pause, inhale, and she's there. In that moment, I am overwhelmed with missing her. And then it passes. You know what I wish? <laughs> I wish I'd shop more with my mother before she got sick, before I realized she wasn't going to be around forever. Because it's not the shopping. It's the time spent together laughing and talking. That, that is what you don't realize when you're 20. anywhere. Do you know a good podiatrist? <laughs> no, I can't do lunch that day. I'm having a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Things I'm no longer afraid to say. No, I can't do lunch that day. I'm having a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite catch that. What? Uh, do you mind repeating that? What? Things I'm still afraid to say. Yes, that really does make your butt look fat. <laughs> no, to be honest, it really wasn't that good for me. <laughs> Things I spend more time thinking about. My financial plan. You have a financial plan? <laughs> My financial planner does. You have a financial planner? Wow. Somehow, Susan, I don't think she's going to be eating out, though. Maybe we can go to her house. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> My financial planner told me, these are your go-go years. <clears throat> Statistically, you've got 15, maybe 20, if you're lucky, good go-go years ahead. Then, you're moving into your slow-go years. <laughs> if you get past those, you move into your no-go years. <laughs> and believe me, by that time, there's not much moving going on. So spend your money now, during your go-go years. Don't save it all for your slow-go years. I mean, be practical, save some, but not a lot. By the time you hit your no-go years, your money should be spent. Because at that point, if you get to that point, which is just a statistical crapshoot, you're not going to know who's spending your money or what it's being spent on, it just goes. So, spend your money now. Why you can keep track of it. Why you can do interesting things with it. Spend it now. Because these are your go-go years. <laughs> well, that was pretty cheerful news to hear from my financial planner that statistically I had 15 to 20 good go-go years ahead. Until she started elaborating on what she thought I ought to spend my money on. <clears throat> Long-term health care insurance? I totally do not get how this insurance works. I don't trust that the money's going to be there when we baby boomers hit the need for it. Because it's just too damn many of us. We're going to collapse the system. All the insurance companies are going to go bankrupt. And not only will I be old and feeble, but I'll be out all that money I spent insuring myself for nothing. <laughs> No, 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 no. Don't worry about it, she assured me. The bean counters have got it all worked <laughs> out. The money's going to be there when you need it, because only half of you are going to be using it. <laughs> the other half, before they need it, will be dead. <laughs> Which leaves me with my last statistical question. Which half will I find? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even think about that stuff. Whenever I hear these concerns about retirement, social security, credit default swaps and the like, uh -huh. 
I just glaze over. You know, they talk about this stuff all the time on the radio. I'll be listening, trying to work, trying to listen, and all of a sudden the program's over and I realize I haven't retained a thing. It was all just white noise. Of course, a lot of that could be blamed on the subject matter. I think so. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, my mind is wandering more these days. Bugs me. I'll be reading a book, not too late at night either, and find myself reading the same paragraph over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This one's really bad. I'll be listening to a friend, making eye contact, nodding my head, acting present, and I'll be just... <laughs> Relationship 
which involve daily contact. What are you using that big pan for? Just a frying pan, Dad. Yeah, I know, but you're only cooking an onion. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to add garlic and peppers and sides. I'm sautéing the onion. I want more flat surface to slide it around on. Can't you slide an onion around in a smaller pan? <laughs> yeah, but what difference does it make? Well, you got to wash the pan after you use it. <laughs> you mean you think it's easier to wash a smaller pan than a bigger one? Of course it is. Makes a smaller job. I'll wash the pan, Dad. Nah, you don't need to wash the pan. It's my kitchen. I'll wash the pan. <laughs> but I want to use a bigger pan, so I'll wash the pan. Well, don't get yourself all worked up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you want. What difference does it make? <laughs> and so ended another one of our daily household exchanges. <laughs> about a week later, we were both sitting across from each other at Dad's cluttered kitchen table, stirring our martinis with toothpicks. <laughs> His pierced two olives, mine pierced one. We stared out the window at a late March snow which was falling, watching about five inches which had accumulated on the back deck. Still coming down, said Dad. Then he lifted his martini glass to snow. <laughs> to another day of skiing, I added optimistically. Nah, <laughs> too late in the season for that. We talked about nothing much for another 10 minutes. Our martinis were halfway down the glass. When Dad said, you're probably not going to like this. Probably not, Dad, but try me. <laughs> well, you know that double bed I've been using. The old spool bed, the one from the, the other house? Yeah, that one. Make any difference to you if I sawed off the end of the thing? <laughs> Why? Well, you're always complaining if I change anything around here or do anything different. No, Dad, I mean, why would it make a difference to me? I mean, why do you want to saw off the end of the bed? You mean the footboard? Yeah, I guess that's what you call it. Well, it's too hard to change the sheets. I gotta squeeze my hands under the mattress between all those little spools. They're too close together. Things of poor design. Nothing but a piece of junk. It's an antique spool bed, Dad. It's an antique piece of junk. Well, that's all it's gonna be if you saw off the footboard. I knew you'd get yourself all <laughs> You don't care about any of this junk I got hanging around here until I decide to change something or try to get rid of something, then you get all upset. Well, why couldn't we just move the single bed down from upstairs? I don't want to go lugging beds up and downstairs. How come we can't just saw off the one that's already down here? <laughs> because it's an antique spool bed, Dad. Because it's the one that you and Ma used to sleep in. Well, that hasn't happened in way too many years. <laughs> I'll help you move the single bed downstairs. No, that'll be just as hard to make up. No, it won't. It's a single bed. The mattress is lighter. You can move around it easier. Look, Dad. If you want, I can come over once a week and change your sheet. No, oh, I don't want you changing my sheet. I can change my own damn sheet. <laughs> Just as that's got a footboard on it, too. <laughs> Do you mind if I saw that one off? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dad, it's not an antique. If it bothers you that much, go ahead, saw it off. What difference does it make? <laughs> After dinner that night, Dad went upstairs to take apart the single bed so that we could move it down. When I went up, he'd already leaned the box spring and mattress against the wall. I'll go down and get the vacuum cleaner to take care of all the dust on those. Well, can't we just sweep it off? Well, yeah, but it would be easier to use the vacuum cleaner. Nah, I'd rather just sweep them off. <laughs> desperately wanted to ask, why? But instead I said, okay. Then I went downstairs to get the vacuum cleaner.
later. Anyway, when I returned, Dad was meticulously <coughs> brushing dust bunnies off the mattress and box spring into a dustpan. While you're finishing that, I'll vacuum the rug. Well, can't you just sweep it? <laughs> sweep the rug? No, I'm, I'm going to vacuum it. Well, why fill up the vacuum cleaner with dust when you can just sweep it into a dustpan and throw it out? Fill the vacuum cleaner with dust? <laughs> Dad, you think that's a bad thing? <laughs> well, it just means I gotta change the bag sooner. I gotta go to the store, get a new one, put all the bother of taking it out, putting it inside that. I don't care what this place looks like. I'm the only one living here. What difference does it make? It makes a difference, Dad. It makes a difference. Because I can't stand to watch you turn into a dusty old man living inside a dusty old house. And don't tell me I'm getting all worked up about nothing because it makes a difference. I watched him stoop down to brush dust bunnies off the rug for several long moments until finally he stood with the ease of a much younger man and stared out the window. The snow was still falling against the light of a street lamp. Then he turned his watery blue eyes on me. You doing anything tomorrow? I know I said it was too late in the season, but it's supposed to be sunny tomorrow. Maybe we, we got an early enough start. You want to go skiing? <laughs> <laughs> now at this point, if both of us weren't such damn Yankees, we might have hugged or said something gooey, but that would have been excessive. <laughs> yeah, Dad, it's not too late. Let's go skiing. Cardiogram. The last time I was tested this much, I was in grade school. So Jean was a little nervous about the test because she's not particularly athletic, so much so that she actually hired a personal trainer to help her get in shape for it. <laughs> really? So it's the day of the test, which is stressful in and of itself. The big moment is approaching time for the treadmill. Jean is ready. She's in the zone doing some deep breathing, a few easy stretches, visualizing a positive outcome. When the nurse says to her, Jean, please remove your clothes from the waist up and put on this Johnny. And Jean says, no. <laughs> no? No. I'm a well-endowed woman and I am not running on that treadmill without a bra. We ask you to remove your bra because the underwire interferes with the imaging we do following the test. Jean, who'd recently taken a class called Open Your Fifth Chakra and Speak Your Truth, stood her ground. <laughs> I'll remove it for the imaging, but I am not running on that treadmill without a bra. This is non-negotiable. <laughs> Jean's determination run... Uh, what is going on? <laughs> Jane's determination won out. She ran on the treadmill, whipped off her bra in time for the imaging, and aced the stress test. I'm not quite in the same category as Jean in terms of abundance, but I sympathize. I went for years without wearing a bra. Now, it's like my American Express card. I don't leave home without it. Because at this point, my personality is the only part of my body that could be described as perky. <laughs> Once I reach middle age, I realize my clothes just look better with a proper foundation because there are some bits of my body that just aren't sticking with the program. <laughs> There's a lumpiness factor that wasn't there in my 20s and pesky places that exercise just can't tone. 
Right now, I am wearing a spanky that goes from here to here. <laughs> That's right. My entire body is encased in spandex. I wouldn't do this for everyone, but you're special. <laughs> a spanky really does make a difference. It smooths things out. And the best part, it feels so good when you take it off. <laughs> now, a spanky's not an everyday kind of thing, but a bra is. I read somewhere that 80% of women in the United States wear bras that are the wrong size. Now, that's not the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night. But in this world where so many things are out of our control, this is an attainable goal. <laughs> Guys, bear with me. I'll get to you later. <laughs> Women, take control of your world by taking control of your breasts. Now, granted, shopping for a bra is not what it once was. Oh. I remember the matronly lingerie saleswomen of my youth, the ones at Lady Grace. They knew how to measure your, you to find the right size. They'd send me into the dressing room with a couple of options, wait until I was naked, and say, how we doing, dear? <laughs> they were knowledgeable, attentive. They waited on me. Nowadays, in a department store, you can't even find a salesperson, let alone a measuring tape. So shopping for a bra means trial and error. I end up going in alone, going dressed and undressed, dressed and undressed, going back and forth with different sizes and styles. That's exhausting. At Victoria's Secret, there's plenty of, hi, are you finding everything you're looking for? But good luck trying to find a salesperson who's even close to your age. I saw one there once who was so young, I think she still had a piece of placenta on her forehead. <laughs> to the uniboo, the quadruple breast or the dreaded back bulges. I googled the right bra size and found a bunch of sites with step-by-step -step instructions on how to measure yourself to find the right size. Or go to, I love this, wizardofbras.com. <laughs> Check out this video called Fitting 101 with bra expert Bonnie Kaufman, who looks a lot like the little old lingerie saleswomen of my youth. De body demonstrates how to measure yourself to find the proper fit. And as if this wasn't enough, there's a bra size calculator. <laughs> I know! Simply enter in your measurements, click the button, and abracadabra, the wizard of bras magically reveals your correct bra size. I was shocked to realize that I too was wearing the wrong size. I was part of that 80%. But no longer. <laughs> Take it from me, perking up your foundations perks you up. <laughs> and when you're perky, when you're middle-aged, perky is a good thing. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that you have to wear a push-up bra and a thong while you're cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> but a sports bra and granny panties for a big night out on the town? <laughs> and guys are not exempt here. You know what I'm talking about. Discolored boxers with a hole in the crotch. <laughs> Briefs with the elastic so worn out they barely stay up. You end up standing at the urinal trying not to attract attention while you desperately grope around for the opening. <laughs> if you think of your underwear as an expression of how you feel deep down about yourself, what is it saying? Be honest. Do you pull it up, snap it on, and go, yeah? Or, have you seen better days? <laughs> Is your elastic shot? <laughs> Are you just a little too comfortable? <laughs> so go home, bite the bullet, and clean out your underwear drawer. Throw away the things you know you should. And then, go shopping. When was the last time you shopped for underwear? If you can't remember, it's definitely time. <laughs> and when you get to the store, I encourage you to risk. Try different colors and styles. Red lace bra, leopard print thong, navy blue briefs, plaid, boxers. Guys, skip the red lace, but may I suggest leopard print thong? <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, reach into your underwear drawer and grab one of your purchases. Enjoy the newness as you pull it up. 
feel the satisfaction as you snap it on and go, yeah. <laughs> so I can nap without interruption. A pill slicer to cut my medical expenses. <laughs> you know your middle age when living dangerously means... Going without my nap. Drinking coffee after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Staying for the band's second set. <laughs> you know your middle age when... You, you get, get up twice, twice a night, night to pee. <laughs> you look around the room and see that the young people at the dance are now all in their 40s. Even the president is younger than you are. You know you're middle-aged when... You ask your friends if they've seen a movie. You know, the one uh, with that married couple, they met at Woodstock. Oh, right, right, right. Now he's a little fuzzy oh, upstairs. Oh, what one. was that? What, um, Alzheimer's? No, no, the movie, the movie. He featured the ball guy, what's his name? Oh. He begins with a B. And then his old girlfriend from high school shows right, up. Right, and she's oh, a little fuzzy guy. upstairs, he's too. And... You reminds me of He's the guy who's married to what's her name? Um, yes, that's him. Sure, we saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> we did. You know you're middle-aged <laughs> when you write a song about having a colonoscopy. <laughs> that seems like a good place to end. <laughs> no buts about it. <laughs> Ba-da-da-da! Uh -huh. 